Hi there. I'm Cindy Linden, and this is the Cook Along Podcast. I used to have this idea in my head about how fabulous it would be to cook dinner for company, and that involved planning a menu that included my favorite appetizer, some newly discovered main dish, a side dish that was tried and true perhaps, a salad made from fresh ingredients from the farmer's market, a dessert that I was in love with and couldn't wait to share with people in the real world. It turns out that that kind of dinner party for company is a fantasy. It's a dream. I won't stop dreaming it. But for the most part, your guests are going to say to you, well, we don't exactly eat this, or we don't eat that, or my wife is allergic to thus and such, or my kids hate nuts, or you name it, it's going to come up. Oh, or for political reasons, I don't eat certain kinds of things. Honestly, I think that there are an increasing number of reasons that people have for not eating things. Once upon a time, when I was a kid, my parents would have regarded those people as picky eaters. But the truth is much more complex than that because there really are health issues and relevant political issues and kids who don't like a lot of things. You know what it took for me to actually hone in on that fact rather than just take it as normal course of events? About a week and a half ago, I served three meals to people who said to me, we have no dietary restrictions and we like everything. If you cook, you would have some idea how rare that is and how special to actually get to choose to cook anything you want. A few years ago, my oldest son and his spouse were attending a college which focused all of its studies through the lens of being environmentally conscious and conscientious and doing things that were better for the world. And as part of that, they both decided that they were no longer going to eat red meat. In fact, they were pescatarian, which means they only ate fish. And then after a while, they decided that certain kinds of chicken were okay. It's all very complicated but they were trying to be really conscientious about how they ate. In my household, they were brought up eating all kinds of meat. In fact, my son's favorite meal was a really good medium-rare steak. All of that was out the window, and here am I trying to hold family holiday dinners or just having them over to spend some time with them and wanting to feed them. And having to confront this new thing of this large swath of ingredients that I couldn't use. One of my go-to recipes, in fact several of my go-to recipes, involve ground beef and or Italian sausage, which is made usually from pork. So I had to branch out and explore, and in the process of doing that, I discovered an Italian chicken sausage that came in plastic wrap tubes, and it's by a company called Icernios. When I first realized I was going to have to use a chicken sausage instead of the regular quote-unquote real thing, I was really dismayed. I figured that the compromise in flavor was going to be enormous, and I was not happy about it, but resigned. But I, in fact, discovered it was really flavorful, and the only meat in it is chicken. And so it was a little better and less fatty and more healthy and a little more conscientious in terms of the environment than using beef. And I discovered after having tried it that we in this multi-meat eating household actually prefer the chicken sausage in almost everything. In the lasagna that I made the other night, I've always used Italian sausage and ground beef in there. This time I used the chicken and it was really good. I also always used the chicken Italian sausage on my homemade pizza. Not because of health reasons or political reasons or environmental reasons, but because we really prefer it. We like the flavor of it. So just as we become really dependent on that in our diet, lo and behold, it becomes very hard to find. It's always been a little hard to find, but since the supply issues of the pandemic, it's become even harder to find. 
So what's a person to do? I don't really want to go back to pork sausage. It just feels weird to do that now. And ground beef is just not Italian sausage. So the answer, of course, is to buy plain ground chicken and turn it into chicken Italian sausage myself. And that's what I'm going to do today. This could have been a quick bite because it's really so simple that we don't need to cook it together. But I had to make some today anyway. So I thought I would just do it with you. What I normally do with this is put it into vacuum sealed four ounce packages and stash them in my freezer because four ounces is about right for the top of a pizza for two. And if I need more than that, I can always get out more than one four ounce package. Today I have two and a half pounds of ground chicken that I'm gonna turn into chicken Italian sausage. And I invite you to come along for the ride, make a note of the seasonings. There may be some you wanna swap out and that's perfectly fine. And there are also some that if you want an Italian flavor are critical to add. You can do this recipe for any kind of meat. You can use beef, pork, chicken, or turkey. I'm not particularly fond of turkey. I feel like it doesn't have as much flavor as chicken does. And in fact, that's true all the way around. I don't mind a turkey sandwich after Thanksgiving, but for Thanksgiving itself, it's really just an excuse to have the stuffing and gravy for me. I don't need all that turkey. I think it's a boring meat. Sorry for all you turkey aficionados. My father was certainly a turkey lover. I am just not one, but the seasoning blend I'm about to give you will work for any kind of meat that you want to make sausage out of and package in your freezer for later. So we're going to start with two pounds of ground meat of your choice. This recipe for the seasoning comes from a website called tastesoflizzytea.com. And thank you to Julie Clark for this recipe because it saved the day for me when I stopped being able to find my favorite chicken Italian sausage in the store. And now I know more about what I'm putting into the final sausage, which I like because I can modify it as it seems appropriate. So here are the ingredients for the seasoning to that two pounds of ground meat. Two teaspoons of dried parsley, two teaspoons of Italian seasoning, that's an Italian herb mix or whatever you have on hand. Penzi's makes a really nice Italian herb blend if you are looking for some place to get one. One and a half teaspoons of a nice black pepper. Regular table black pepper is fine, but if you have something that's a little coarser ground, that's even better. A half teaspoon of fennel seed, And I'm using whole because the whole seeds are what you find in actual Italian sausage. You can crush it if you don't like the seeds in there, but I like them whole. A half teaspoon of paprika, that's regular sweet paprika, not smoked paprika. A teaspoon of red pepper flakes, also known as crushed red pepper. Two teaspoons of salt. A tablespoon of minced garlic. And just for the sake of making it really wonderful, you wanna use fresh. If you're making a huge batch bigger than two pounds and you don't want to mince all that garlic, you can swap it out for some dried minced garlic or some of that kind that comes in a jar, although I really don't advocate for that because it really tastes nothing like garlic. A teaspoon of minced onions, same story as the garlic. Best to use it fresh. If not, you can use onion flakes or minced dried onions or whatever you have if you're making a huge batch. That's it. There's really no instructions to this. We're just going to put all the seasonings together and mix it into the meat. Now, if you don't want to make the completed sausage ahead of time for your freezer, and you just want to have the seasoning blend in your cabinet so that you can make it as you go, change the fresh minced garlic for either garlic powder or dried minced garlic. And same with the onions. You can't use the fresh and have it store, but... You can just use all dried seasonings in the same proportions as what I just gave you and put them in a nice tightly sealed jar and keep it in your pantry for the next time you want Italian sausage. And for some of you, maybe many of you, that might be easier than trying to stick it in your freezer. Because I am using both fresh onions and fresh garlic, we have to start there. So I've got a big bowl here in front of me and I'm peeling the paper outside off the onions. I just pulled some new ones out of my yard. This is not them, but I'm kind of excited. I'm always excited to pull onions up out of my yard. 
And you know how I plant them. Maybe I've talked to you about this before. When you get to the bottom of the onion and all you have is the chunk where the root is, rather than cutting that up or throwing that away or whatever, just put it in a little bowl of water until the roots grow out a bit. And then you go plant it to stick it in your yard. We also grow strawberries. And onion is something that slugs don't like. So if you plant the onion among your strawberries you will have fewer slugs eating your strawberries before you get to them. That's your unexpected trivia tip for today. So all we need here is a teaspoon of minced onion. That's almost nothing. So I'm just doing a tiny slice here. And as I told you, I have about two and a half pounds of meat, so I'm going to add a little extra. But for your two pounds, it's like the very end slice. And you want to chop it up tiny, tiny, tiny minced. My circle was maybe an inch and a half. It might have been two inches. And I've minced that tiny, and that is easily a teaspoon here. Of course, the tinier you can cut it, the further it's going to spread out in your sausage. So get it as small as you can. And then put that in the bottom of the big bowl. The next thing that's also wet is, of course, the garlic. And for that, we want a tablespoon of minced garlic. I have here four pretty sizable cloves. And that may make more than a tablespoon, but I will refer you to other points in my podcast when I have said there's no such thing as too much garlic. And it's better to have more than it calls for than less. What I'm doing now is with these large cloves, I'm cutting off the dry end that connects it to the bulb. If you cook it all, you've done this many times and you already know this. You cut off that little dry end. You take the bulb itself and you put it on your cutting board and using the flat of your knife, you put that on top of the garlic clove and you just push down until it cracks. And then that skin will just peel right off. And we don't need it whole or pretty because we're gonna mince it up tiny anyway. That was the second one. And I'll tell you another secret about the mincing in a moment. We're going to cheat on that as well. And then the final fourth one. Now, as I've told this story many times, you can stand here and mince that garlic if you want to. But America's Test Kitchen, where they chop garlic all day probably, trying to get the things just right, they don't mince garlic anymore. Because they figured out that a good garlic press will give you pieces about the same size with a lot less work. So that's what I am doing here, is I'm using my garlic press, which is made by OXO. I picked it out because it has especially large holes so that I can get mince sized pieces of garlic. Plus it has one of those cleaner things, you know, where you turn it inside out, or backwards rather, and it pushes the garlic out of the inside through the holes. It's Kind of hard to describe, but I like it. Here goes clove number two. And clove number three. You know what? I think this might not be a tablespoon. I think I'm actually going to be light. Well, let's see. Let's do the fourth one and find out. I don't think it is enough. I think I'm going to do another. Okay, so I'm going to change what I told you. These were big cloves, by the way. These were really large cloves. And I think four is not enough. I think four wouldn't even fill my tablespoon as I look over there at it. I'm not measuring, but I'm eyeing it. So I'm going to grab another large one. If I have any more large ones left, you know, they get smaller toward the middle. Oh, yeah, this is a, this one is disguised. It's pretending to be a large one. I think it's actually three small ones. I'll cut off the end and see. Yeah, pretty much. And then they have all this paper on them. Okay, I'm going to go away for a minute because now they have all this fine paper on these three that I'm going to squish. Uh, I wish all garlic cloves could be predictably the same size. I'll be back in a moment. Okay, I've squished those last ones of garlic. And you know what? There's always some that gets left inside the garlic press. And I just scrape that out from the inside because I figure it is also pretty much minced. And I just use what's in there so that I get all of the garlic. And this is still, well, this is maybe a tablespoon. So yes, it takes a lot of garlic cloves to get what you need. 
Now the other seasonings are all dry, so this is easy. We just need some measuring spoons. Two teaspoons of dried parsley, two teaspoons of Italian seasoning, and you hopefully have that in your house. Really, if you have no other seasonings in your house, you need to have the Italian seasoning because you can use it in so many things. It's not only what I make my spaghetti with, it's also what I make my fried chicken batter with. Great stuff I have in the house. And speaking of which, now that I think about it, there is a blog on my website, thecookalongpodcast.com, about things to have in your kitchen. It's four parts. I think it's part four. You might look for that. It's some pretty kind of basic, you should have these spices in your kitchen because sooner or later it's going to come up and it's going to come up more often than you expect to. That's the list that you'll find on that blog. Now we need one and a half teaspoons of that black pepper of your choice. Going through all the measuring spoons today. That's three half teaspoons. And then a half teaspoon of fennel seed. This is really one of the secret ingredients to making Italian sausage. It's that one in there that makes it distinct from breakfast sausage or bratwurst or whatever. It's the fennel. Half a teaspoon of paprika. I'm using a Hungarian sweet that comes from Penzi's because, as you know, I like Penzi's and I also work for them when I'm not here cooking with you. It's a fabulous, fun job to get to talk to people about cooking all day. And then a teaspoon of crushed red pepper flakes. And that just adds a little zip, which is a good thing in a sausage. And the two teaspoons of salt. And I'm using a fine sea salt for this. If you're using a kosher salt, you want to go a little heavy on it. Because kosher salt's a little bit less salty. That's it. That's our seasoning mix. And all that's left is to add the ground meat. I suppose if you were feeling really ambitious, you could even grind your own chicken. That's really too much work for me. I'm not interested in that. Speaking of which, for the past week or so, I've had a line from a song stuck in my head. It's a line from a Broadway musical by Stephen Sondheim called Sunday in the Park with George. And it's about an artist about a real artist, but it's a fictional story, because who knows? The sequence of lines is, a man says, I should have been an artist. I was never meant for work. And the woman he's with says, Artists work, Franz. I believe they work very hard. And Franz, after going through the list of all the things that he does and she does as servants, says... Work is what you do for others, Liebchen. Art is what you do for yourself. I can't get that out of my head, and I've been thinking about it. Work is what you do for others. Art is what you do for yourself. My kitchen has come to be known in my house as the artist's studio because that's the way that people who live with me can survive the mess I make in a kitchen. If it's an artist's studio, it's okay for it to get completely trashed during the creation of the art, right? And I do regard my cooking work as art. By the way, what I'm doing while I'm talking to you is mixing this with my hands. Just easier than a spoon somehow to get everything mixed together. I consider it art because it feels like art to me. It feels creative and exciting and fun and as though it's going to turn into something beautiful. So I think of it as art as well. But cooking is an interesting thing because art is what you do for yourself and that is indeed why I cook, I think, because it's exciting to me and I love what happens when I do it. And work is what you do for others and cooking Obviously, when you're done making the art, it's no longer just for you. And I think some art, it really is still the artist's work. But with cooking, cooking is sort of a crossbreed between art and work. The artist makes the art, but the artwork is for others. This sausage is looking beautiful and smelling amazing. 
all we have to do now is get all those spices mixed into the meat pretty evenly. And then I'm going to divide this using my scale into four ounce meatballs and vacuum seal them for my freezer. I'd like to highly recommend that you follow the same procedure, even if you don't have a vacuum sealer. Just put it in some really good Ziploc bags that you've squished the air out of and mark what it is so you don't think it's hamburger. Freeze it in small portions so that you can pull it out to use in the near future whenever you need some without having to make any more. Keep this in mind next time you're looking for Italian sausage of any kind. You don't have to make do with things that have a bunch of preservatives or stabilizers or spices you don't like. If I've listed some spices that you know you don't like, change them. Change them up. But if you want it to taste like an Italian sausage, the only two things you really need to keep are the Italian herbs and the fennel. I think you'd miss the red pepper, but maybe you don't really want any of that in there and you'd rather have a little more oregano. Go ahead and throw that in. Just make it to taste and you won't know that, of course, until you've actually tried it. If you're making this to use in a recipe right now, it is ready to cook. Turn it into meatballs or crumble it into your pan and brown it in a large skillet and use it in whatever way you had intended to use it. For the rest of us, saving it for later, I'm going to go package that up now. I'm sure you'll use this recipe often until it becomes your own, whether that's because you modified it or you just decide to claim it because you make it so often. So go enjoy. And until next time, happy cooking. 